lots of people and then we'll um, get started. Um, I think everyone is automatically going to mute, but I'll just say that as a, um, as a usual, as a sort of thing, if, if everyone's got, you know, and um, we'll, we'll go over some house, housekeeping in a moment. Um, but I'm just going to keep an eye on the numbers that are coming in and once they start slow, I'll get started. Okay, we'll maybe just get, I think we'll probably get started now. Um, so um, my name is Kat Headley. Uh, I'm a solicitor in Edinburgh, a occasional commentator, and I was a Labour Party candidate in the 2016 Holyrood election. And um, we, you join us for a panel on the topic of um, what kind of country does Scotland want to be? Um, this feels uh, one way or another, uh, a topic that has basically dominated um, the, the Scottish political um, discussion, uh, well, arguably um, since the 1980s, uh, leading up to devolution, uh, and then since, particularly since 2007, um, in terms of the issue of independence. Um, but we are, uh, what kind of country Scotland wants to be isn't just about um, uh, the constitutional settlement. It is on a number of different topics in terms of policy and in terms of where that opinion kind of comes from. Is it uh, inward looking, outward looking? For who, for whom is it? Is it uh, meant to be? Um, by whom? And uh, is there actually any unified view in relation to um, what Scotland should be, um, bearing in mind the different demographics, um, the um, difference between uh, rural Scotland and urban Scotland? Um, and actually, as um, was suggested this week by Professor James Chalmers, um, have we really just had a middle class parliament for a middle class country? So um, we've got an excellent panel today. Um, uh, firstly, conquering hero, Jackie Bailey, fresh from the trail. Um, she really needs no introduction, um, but uh, I'll give her one anyway. Um, she is obviously the uh, Scottish Labour deputy leader. Um, returned um, MSP for Dumbarton and has been since the um, the start of a uh, Scottish Parliament and uh, and also a meme sensation um, on on Twitter. Uh, we have also got um, Fiona Matu, um, who is a social entrepreneur and co-founder of a Radiant and Brighter Community Interest Company, which is a social uh, enterprise and award-winning one at such. And she works with minority ethnic communities in Scotland uh, to provide integration, support, uh, employment, leadership and business startup programmes. And we also have uh, Russell Gunson, who's the director of IPPR Scotland, which is a progressive think tank. Um, and he has also worked across government, parliament uh, and was a director of the National Union of Students. And also, I am told by Jackie, a karaoke aficionado. So um, thank you very much. We are going to be starting... Um, with some introductory remarks of around three or so minutes um, from each of our panelists. Um, and then we will go into um, a, a discussion which I'll facilitate um, and then we will have some questions. So please um, feel free to um, uh, put some questions into the chat box. Um, the more that there are, the more I will um, actually kind of balance that between uh, the, our sections which are going to be about um, the um, our our discussion and your discussion. So please feel free to throw that in, whether in whatever um, way you interpret the question. Um, so um, I'm going to going to start um, with Jackie, um, and um, so Jackie, um, if your introductory comments, but we'll come to. Uh, I've got my leading question, but we'll come to that afterwards. So um, thank you very much, Jackie. Um, if you want to get started. Okay, thank you very much, Kat, for the kind introduction and to um, progress for the opportunity to speak. Can I make just a couple of observations? Firstly, the first thing I want to say is, is um, that Scottish Labour, I think, are now back on the pitch. And the second thing is um, a discussion about the battle between identity politics and progressive politics. So, you know, my evidence for Scottish Labour being back on the pitch was the election 10 days ago. And whilst on the face of it, our vote 
hasn't you know, increased in terms of its share. The number of seats hasn't increased. Um, actually, the number of people voting Labour was higher than 2016, higher than the 2019 general election, um, and stands us in good stead. I think an ass taking over 10 weeks before polling day, um, when our support was at something like 14%, has turned our result round with a tremendous effort. Our campaign was upbeat, it was positive, it wasn't about the old divisions. Um, and I have to say, although he would be too modest to say this himself, he is now the most popular opposition leader, I think, in the whole of the UK, and we need to work much harder to translate that into votes. But let me absolutely agree with Bridget, and this is the, the, the first learning point for me. Um, we were having great conversations on the doorsteps. Um, people weren't slamming the doors on in our faces as they did in 2016. Um, so Scottish Labour has permission to be heard again. That's really powerful. And we just cannot wait until the next election before we continue those conversations with people. That provides us with a platform to build on. Second issue for me is identity versus progressive politics. And let me say quite clearly for those um, who don't come from within Scotland, there is nothing progressive about the SNP or the politics of identity alone. The, the election we know was framed about conflicting agendas. Scottish Labour talked about recovery, talked about building a stronger, fairer nation. The SNP and the Tories talked almost exclusively about independence and whether it was good or bad. Yet poll after poll shows that we are deeply divided as a country on the constitution, but we care about the same things as people in the rest of the UK. The NHS, jobs, the economy, education, climate change, all of those things are the same. So let me say what I think we need to do just very briefly. Of course, I'm proud to be Scottish, as are the Scottish group of Labour MSPs, but we would be prouder still if we secured a job for everyone, particularly those who haven't yet come off furlough, if we had a world-class education system, if we had an NHS and social care system where treatment was not rationed, if we eliminated child poverty, and we know we don't need independence to do any of that. That independence would result in 2,000 pounds less public spending per head of the population. That isn't a good start to having a progressive Scotland. So what we need to do, certainly in the parliament and wider, we need to stake out our territory very clearly, Labour territory. We need to highlight SNP failings, but above all, as Anas said earlier, we need to offer people hope, empathy, and solutions that demonstrate we're on their side. Thanks, Kat. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, and we're obviously going to touch on quite a few of the issues that you've talked about there um, when we come on to our, our discussion. I'm sure there'll be come out of, of the questions too. So um, going now to Fiona, um, Fiona, I'd be really interested to hear what um, your view in relation to um, what kind of country Scotland wants to be. And also from your experience as a social entrepreneur and working particularly with um, ethnic minority communities, um, what kind of country it is? Thank you, Kat. Thank you. Thank you for, for the invite to, to, to share my thoughts and to have this conversation. Um, I First of all, I need to say that um, I moved here uh, to Scotland about 13 years ago, coming to 14 now. I've been in the UK for over 24 years and our youngest son was born in Scotland. He's as Scottish as they come. And I think it is important for me and that says to me the Scotland that we are now and the Scotland that I would like to see and the Scotland that speaks to us. Um, often when we hear about migration and we hear about minority ethnic communities, the rhetoric is around what they come to take. The rhetoric is around asylum seekers and refugees that, um, that perhaps don't, you know, are perceived not to contribute. First, I need to say I'm not an asylum seeker and I'm not a refugee, but I am a migrant. But what I think Scotland is, is right now is a progressive Scotland in the sense that we are positioning ourselves as a country that has a global reach. Ambitions, and I think it's a great opportunity for Scotland. I do also think that we need to be thinking about as we get out of the 
the difficult circumstances that perhaps every country now finds itself in, and we're looking at economic growth, I think it is important that we're considering the contribution of migrants and minority ethnic communities. Research was done in 2019 that showed that migrants contribute 13 billion to the Scottish economy every year, and that over 100,000 jobs are created by migrant communities and minority ethnic communities. I think we need to be changing the rhetoric. We need to understand that minority ethnic communities do contribute. I think we need to be speaking to every single person that is able to contribute. Research shows that migrants are natural entrepreneurs because we've already taken risk and we'll take risk again. I do know that right now in the way that we are going, there are issues that we need to address. I need not uh, uh, remind everybody of the, the issues that have been highlighted by the pandemic in regard to how minority ethnic communities are uh, perceived, supported, or indeed the challenges that have been highlighted. However, what we now need to do is how we move from that. Research done by the, uh, the Equalities and Human Rights Commission showed that, um, that uh, minority racism at 72 percent within the private sector and 86 percent within the public sector that says to minority ethnic communities we don't want you we don't need you we don't see you therefore we don't value you for me a progressive scotland is one that values every single person regardless of where they come from regardless of their color regardless of uh, of who they are because we are all here to try and bring our best. And so we need to ensure that the contribution regardless of background. Thank you very much, Fiona. And um, Russell, so as, as director of IPPR Scotland, you are, um, you know, you, your, your job is really to consider um, the, the policies that would make um, Scotland the country that it, it, it wants to be or, or, or could be. Um, so um, I'm really interested to hear your, your thoughts um, and, um, and then we'll, we'll start our discussion. Yeah, and again, thanks for having me here today. I wish it was in 3D rather than 2D, but um, maybe soon. Um, and I should say at the start, we're a cross-party organisation, so we're here as a critical friend, regardless of our personal friendships um, into the Labour Party. And we're neutral on the question of independence too, so we're, we're sort of observer status, if you like, here today. Uh, but we're not neutral on the type of Scotland we want to see. So as you say, Kat, um, we want to see a fairer Scotland, a more progressive Scotland. Um, and so in terms of the question today, I think um, you touched on it, Kat, in the introduction, but there probably are very few positions where there's unanimity in Scotland, um, particularly, as you can see, after the election last week. Um, I mean, just take Glasgow over this last week. You could look at the non-violent protests against immigration removals. You could look at the crowd trouble last night and have a very different impression of just one city in Scotland, never mind Scotland as a whole. So other than maybe COVID not happening, other than rebuilding from COVID in a better way than we went into the crisis, there would probably be few things that unite Scotland across all of us. But there are some where you can see definitive support and they can maybe help us answer the question set today. In terms of Scotland's place in the world and in the UK, um, there's three big things here. So there's a clear majority in Scotland didn't want to leave the EU and still doesn't. Um, however, again, that's not consistent. Northeast of Scotland seemed to vote uh, with that most pressing in their mind, in fact, in the way that the rest of the UK probably did. A clear majority in Scotland don't want to, uh, or don't seem to want Boris Johnson as prime minister. He didn't set foot in Scotland throughout the campaign. Um, his approval ratings are only worst, if you like, by Alex Salmond um, in Scotland, and they're, they're pretty negative. And this is crucial for independence. Whilst there's a pretty much 50-50 split on the question of independence, there's much less of a split when it comes to who should decide. So about 60-odd, 61%, I think, think Holyrood should have the final say as to whether a referendum happens or not. And I picked those three because they're really important for the next few years. So once Brexit's gone, once we hope the COVID crisis has gone, the question does turn to the SNP and, and Tories will make the question turn to an independence referendum. Um, Boris saying no is probably the last person that we want to be giving that message to Scotland. Uh, Brexit coming to fruition um, and equally Boris Johnson perhaps staying longer than we hope or want. 
Um, those are big, big and serious implications, I think, for Scotland. But for social policy, which is our domain, it's where we focus. We don't really um, get involved in what more powers could come or should come. I think there's some general evidence that Scotland is at least marginally, if not a bit more than that, more progressive than the rest of the UK. A pretty consistent 10% in most binary choices see Scotland take a more progressive position. Um, and that's reflected in the new parliament in the priorities that we've had since the evolution. So just transition, good jobs, fair work, inclusive growth, well-being, all of these big ambitions um, you think you can see quite broad support for in Scotland. The crucial thing, and it's where I, in essence, end, um, is around delivery though. So I think Scotland does want to be a place where big ambitions, big promises are made, but this has to be the term where those promises are met. Um, because we can't continually pat ourselves on the back for setting targets or passing legislation. We have to show progress on the ground. And that's where, of course, the new Scottish government will come in, but the whole Scottish Parliament needs to come into that. And there's a big role, therefore, for, for Scottish Labour in, in holding the government to account, but also in promoting that progress on the ground. So if the last government, the last parliament was about setting ambitions, this next one has to be about taking the action needed to meet them. And that will have a role as much for Scottish Labour as it will for the whole of the parliament. Thank you very much. OK, so I think for a, a first kind of question, and this actually touched on what you've just said, Russell, is about actually about the most recent Hollywood election. And I'd be interested to know what the panel think about what um, does this recent election at the campaign, as well as the result, um, does that reflect the country that Scotland wants to be? And in, in some ways, does it even reflect the country that Scotland actually is? So uh, that's the, that's the, the, the opener. Um, and I'm going to start with Jackie. I think the disappointing thing from my perspective was, you know, the campaign was really quite divisive. It was a, a question and framed as, are you for independence or are you against independence? And actually details of the SNP's record or people's manifestos and the opportunities they were presenting for the future kind of didn't get the airtime that I thought it deserved. So we ended up in a very binary debate um, between false choices and actually did not focus on, you know, what was what mattered to my community. You know, the fact that my local area re relies on tourism, most of the tourism jobs are still in furlough, um, the country's not opened up again, there are going to be swathes of unemployed people of a like we haven't seen since the global financial recession. Um, not a lot of conversation about that, not a lot of conversation about how you remobilize the NHS, at a point where doctors and nurses are falling over themselves to retire and we are seeing increasing rationing of services. Um, again, not a lot of conversation about that. So, you know, if you wanted this election to shine a light on what the future of Scotland would look like, then you would be sorely disappointed because it wasn't happening in the debates in my areas. Where I think there was a difference and where I think there is hope is that was happening on the doorstep. Now, we couldn't get around all 60,000 doors in my area, but, but we made a very good attempt at it. And those kind of quality conversations need to continue because that's where people were raising the things that mattered to them. That was less about whether we were independent or not. And I point to a poll that issued today, I think, um, that suggested is a very low priority for people in Scotland, um, the next independence referendum. And in fact, in fact, when asked, they don't believe that the current parliament has a mandate to pursue it. So we should get on with, as some people would say, the day job and do it fast. Thank you. And Fiona, for, for, for you as an individual and also the communities that you that you work in, um, and also as a as an entrepreneur, um, do you feel that the um the the election reflected the sort of the progressive Scotland that you identified in your opening remarks? Or was it was it something else? I think in some ways, um, I, 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 it's, it's evident that we now have more minority ethnic communities represented in the politics that we have right now in Scotland. And so um, as demographics have changed in Scotland, I think it is important that we have that representation. And so in that way, I think there's been a 
progress. I think there is more to be done, but I think there's a bit of progress. I think what we now need to do, and, and I think what I did not hear in this in, in this um, in these elections, I did not hear anybody explicitly say how they are going to be speaking to people like me, how they're going to be speaking to minority ethnic communities. So in regard to representation that's increased in some way, I think we can do more. But I do also think that to take a little of and uh, to action taken, there are several uh, conversations that have been heard previously. There's research that's been done in regard to the inclusivity of minority ethnic communities. I still think that there isn't anything tangible that I can point to and say that's going to be done to ensure that the children that are being that are now growing up here will actually be included in the opportunities that are available. Neither can I actually say that as an entrepreneur, I feel that what I'm contributing is valued or that what the community is contributing is going to be valued. There's no action there from any of politics at the moment that I can answer. And I think that some of it comes from the lack of understanding of the value that minority ethnic communities bring. Because important have an aging relation. That's something that's known. And so the the in migration is in Scotland. So I would see a little more being said around how we can work and how that inclusivity is going to be achieved in an actionable way. I need to see a bit more action. Thank you very much. And yeah, and Russell, you know, this is what we're talking about. You know, this leads very neatly to what you were talking about in your opening remarks about the ambition against versus the action and the sort of the rhetoric of a socially progressive Scotland against the realities of choices um, which have been made, powers that have been used, powers that haven't been used. Um, you know, our, and you know, we've got the most recent social attitude survey talks about how 81% of respondents in Scotland didn't feel that society was structured in the way that it ought to be in comparison to, I think it was 77% in England. That's, you know, there's barely no difference there. So, what is the, um, you know, and you've talked about the sort of the, the, the last bit about being ambition, but actually, you know, the SNP have been in government for 14 years. Um, it's, it's, you know, there would be a lot of people, I suspect Jackie included, would, um, would, would be first among those to say that uh, actually it, the time for action was, has, has been quite a while ago. So where, where does this election stand? You know, what, what can we actually hope to see uh, in terms of, a, of of that progressive Scotland, I think I'd agree with Jackie that um, the campaign, you know, was dominated very much by two C's: the COVID and the Constitution. Um, and even COVID, it was a much nearer term debate than the one we probably needed or need to have about how we recover. That's, you know, big. The, the general, if not the specific thrust of the Scottish Labour Manifesto was about recovery. And it would have been good to have seen a, a debate similarly across all the parties, I think. Um, in the absence of that, where, you know, where we need to go as a, as a Scottish Parliament or as a Scotland next is to get into those debates. We have to not just, um, you know, the, I think all of the manifestos have some really good progressive ideas in them. Um, but what was less focused on in, in probably all the manifestos was how to go about paying for them and delivering them. Um, and I think that is you know, where we can come in. That's where uh, all of us that are based in Scotland can come in to put pressure on um, the SNP, but also the whole of the parliament to make sure that we're not just um, living in a, in a world where we can promise anything and it doesn't matter if we don't deliver it. We see where that goes down south and um, that lack of accountability with um, you know the, the the suspicion around PPE contracts more broadly, the the ministerial code breaking that we've seen, there's a worry that a similar level of a, a lack of accountability up here um, leads to you know maybe less of that, but more of the promises and lack of delivery. So I think that has to be where we we get into it. Um, and how and, you know it's the it's the pressure that we can all ex uh, exert as both um, you know actors outside of politics, those active within, but of course Jackie and colleagues in the Scottish Parliament too. Thank you very much.
And I think we've, you know, we've, I think we've actually possibly, we've kind of, um, as it often happens in Scotland, we've kind of skipped over the actual question here is that, you know, what is the Scotland that they, you know, the country, or what kind of country does, the, does Scotland want to be? And I think that there are often um, blind assumptions that are made um, because Scotland, in terms of its political makeup, makeup and its party political affiliation, is that it is predominantly social democrat centre to centre left parties. Um, but that, you know, there is a, a sizable, you know, when we were doing, and Russell, you talked about the fact that the, the majority of people in Scotland um, wanted to stay in the EU, but there is a significant chunk of the, of the population who didn't. There's a significant chunk of yes voters and a significant chunk of the SNP who were actually in favour of Brexit. So what, when we talk about Scotland in this context, what is, is that a mainstream Scottish opinion? Um, is it a commonly held kind of set of views that are actually reflective of a diverse um, set cross section of Scotland, or are we actually just talking about a singular political outlook, which is um, held by the a large minority people? And and Fiona, perhaps would you like to kind of come in on this first? I think I think it's um, it's it, it, the the independent Scotland that we talk about or you know the the issues around Brexit I think I feel that Scotland is is very ambitious in terms of being a global player and I think that for us to be a global player we need to position ourselves in a way that we speak to the rest of the world as well so for me it still comes back to what does that mean and I don't think that a person like me, or indeed um, uh, the voters, that we are clear on exactly what that means. What does it mean uh, to to stay within Europe, and what does that mean to 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 be independent in the Scottish perspective? I think what we hear the most really is from from down south. So I think that we need to be considering how do we position ourselves as a global player how do we speak to the rest of the world we do know that many years ago we thought you know china was just china and now everything is in is is, is coming from china and africa is an emerging economy as well so for me it is how are we positioning ourselves what does that really mean so being independent or not being independent it's what does that actually mean for us as a global player, and we need to make that clear in order to um, to be able to position ourselves progressively. Oh, Jackie, have you got? A... Yeah, I think the problem is we present the electorate with binary choices. Do you want leave or remain? Do you want yes or no? And actually the diversity of thinking um, gets lost in, in, in that binary choice. Um, and when we present people with a binary choice, let, let me describe to you what went on in my local community. Um, they, they frankly think we can do better than Boris Johnson. He is the best recruiting uh, agent for nationalism in Scotland than, than anything else that I have seen. Um, and during the 2014 independence referendum, um, I would go along and make the economic arguments at a public meeting and somebody else would read a poem. Now that's a stark kind of difference, but they captured the emotion and I was busy trying to have an argument about facts and figures. And the truth is, if you're living in a poor community and somebody offers hope of a fair and more progressive society, you grab it with both hands. So what we need to do and the, the challenge for us is yes, Labour set up a constitutional commission, but what is it saying to people that's going to make them change their lives? You know, I was very conscious. We all stood on a Thursday evening clapping for nurses, but that wasn't just nurses in Scotland. It was nurses across the UK. So what emotional kind of lines do we need to develop that we all understand the benefit of being part of the United Kingdom extends beyond the prime minister of the country at the moment into a 300 year shared history that has Scots living in, in not just the rest of the UK, but the Scottish diaspora is global. 
Um, how do we capture some of that emotion that is about not just looking inward and, and adopting narrow nationalism, but actually what Scots do well is look outward and be international. How do we capture that emotion with a policy agenda that matches it, that appeals to people in my community so that independence isn't the false dawn and attractive to them that they think it is? Thanks, Kat. Russell, you know, kind of, um... In your in your line of work, when you're you know working on lots of different policies, you know, Scotland has had the opportunity to vote for quite radical um, manifesto pledges, um, particularly at various different junctures. Um, you know, there was the, the penny for Scotland, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, and which was rejected. You know, are, are is the is the sort of the, is the myth that surrounds the idea of Scotland's idea of itself and the reality are they different things or is it just that we haven't been able to articulate um, and provide the leadership for that vision of Scotland properly yet? I think there's um, there's a trap I think for and I speak relatively dispassionately or as dispassionate as anybody can be on these matters but um, there's a trap for those that are pro UK in that and I don't think Jackie or Fiona falls into this trap. But um, you don't want to deny differences. You know, Scotland may well be different from the rest of the UK. We've always had a different legal and education system, for example, that was recognised right back from the Act of Union. And you can see in polling some differences. They're not huge, but they're, they're probably notable. Um, so if you look at whether well, taxes are too low, 44% um, think so in Scotland, 36% think in England. It's 8%. That's quite large in a binary question. Income distribution is unfair, 72% in Scotland, 64% in England. There is some evidence of a slightly more progressive uh, slant amongst the general public in Scotland. But that isn't that shouldn't be seen as, that shouldn't put pro-UK people on the defensive. Um, that is exactly why devolution is here. And that's been recognised throughout the history of the union, that there are differences within the union. And I think there's a similar trap around more powers. Um, so more powers shouldn't be defined by some in the pro-UK side as a win for the pro-independent side. Um, it's about trying to get the devolution process, after all, uh, not an event, the devolution process right. And we will, of course, find that more powers may be necessary in the future. I'm not saying that that would be where you'd spend your time now. So in short, um, you know, there are differences probably between Scotland and the rest of the UK, but that's OK. And that's, that's always been the way. And it shouldn't be seen as... Uh, uh, a negative for the union or the pro-union side, it's absolutely something that pro-UK should be quite relaxed about and respond to. And so you can see uh, some differences in the policy agendas in Scotland. So we do have higher taxes to some extent. We do spend more um, on public services to some extent. We've got new social security payments in Scotland and they've, uh, they're have cross-party. So even the Conservatives actually supported doubling um, the Scottish child payment, something we've called for. Um, so there are differences, but that's OK if you're from a pro-UK side would be my sort of uh, uh, sum up. So I'm going to ask one last question before we go to the, 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 um, the contributions from um, those who have joined us is about um, the con is the constitutional debate. And, and in, in that, I mean the discussion about powers and whether that be further devolution, whether that be devolution at all, whether that be federalism, whether that be independence. Does or is that debate and having that debate, is that fundamental to Scotland becoming the country it wants to be? Or is that having that debate holding it back? And so that's the, my last sort of slightly sort of um, um, vaguely sort of controver well, controversial, it's not quite controversial, cause question for everyone. So I'm going to start with Russell, I'm actually going to go with you, I'm going to go straight back to you. Yeah, is it? And, and typical think tank, isn't it? I'm going to say a bit of both and, and sort of, I don't know if that's copping out or uh, being accurate, but um, there's absolutely more that can be done with the existing power. Oh. Russell, I think we might have lost you. Jackie, are you, have you lost Russell as well? I've lost Russell too. Oh dear. Well, Fiona, we'll maybe go to you, Fiona, if you can, and I'll come. We'll come back to Russell if he unfreezes. Um, he's not. It's not the worst face that he's he's frozen on. I've seen worse <laughs> on Zoom calls, so that's okay. Um, but Fiona, we'll go to you, and then we'll see what what if we can get Russell back. 
Well, I originally come from uh, Uganda. That's a country where any kind of discussion is not upheld. Any kind of uh, debate is quashed. Uh, if you want to do something in Uganda, a public conversation may not get you anywhere. And so there is a time when I went to vote and it was quiet and I walked in, made my vote and within five minutes, really the 10 minutes I was, I'd voted and I'd come back home. And I reflected on that. And I thought this is a privilege that some people do not have. It's a privilege that my country may not necessarily have. The last, the last time we voted, uh, the last time there was a vote, literally the whole internet got down. And so coming from that perspective, I believe in conversation, I believe in discussion, and I do believe that having that conversation, if people do want to have that conversation, and if people are still continuing the conversation, have the conversation and, and come to the end of it. Perhaps sometimes the challenges we have in uh, Scottish politics and perhaps UK politics in general, I think is that we have conversations and we never get to the bottom of it. I think it's important that we get to the bottom of it. I think it's important that people get to feel that we've had that and we've come to the end of it. That takes a lot of work. It takes a period of time, but I think it's, it's, it's the beauty of being in a, in a democratic country, but also it can be uh, undemocratic if you're having the conversations and not getting to the bottom of it. So I think, I think uh, talking, discussing um, is not a holdback, never is. I think how you have that conversation, how you come to the bottom of it is what holds back. Thank you very much. I think we're still trying to get um, Russell back, but I mean, Jackie, I think you, you touched actually on the Scotland on Sunday poll that's just been published today. And it talks about what basically Fiona's saying is that, um, I mean, we might not, there, there may be a, a majority, even if it, that's just by a little bit about the kind of idea that what Scotland might want to be on a sort of progressive kind of value, values matrix. But there isn't even a there isn't really any agreement as to whether or not we should be focusing on that or having the constitutional debates. You know, there's a there is a split in terms of you know there's I think you know 27 percent of people don't want to have ever have to have a referendum again, and there and then and then there's a, a you know another not so dissimilar figure that want to have it in the next sort of two years, and then it's 40 percent believe that the election was a mandate for. Um, for another referendum and 40% believe that it wasn't. Um, are, 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 we, are we currently so divided that actually progress towards what Scotland could be is, is inevitably hampered? Are we ever going to get out of this? Yeah, and, and, and I absolutely agree with your analysis, Kat, because you know, the, what the figures tell me in those polls is that people don't want a referendum now. And when pushed, they push it back to three, four, five years. And when you ask them in three, four, five years, the same group of people are pushing it back for another three, four, five years. Um, and for a lot of us, we felt, you know, that we had that discussion and debate in 2014. Um, I did nothing but talk about it for months on end. We thought we'd come to a conclusion. It was very clear what the country wanted to do. Um, and we were promised it, it would be once in a generation. Now, clearly that's not the case anymore. Um, and the really frustrating thing for me is I do think that debate is holding Scotland back because whilst we're all debating the constitution, child poverty has increased, rough sleeping prior to the pandemic was up. Um, you know, it, the, the, the thing that frightened me aside from drug deaths being the highest in Europe, we also for the first time, and I was trying to check, but I haven't been able to do so. I think since records began, life expectancy is actually going the wrong way in Scotland. Where is the debate about that? Where is the media interest in that? You know, and even and I include. I know politicians blaming the media is the wrong thing to do, but but please feel my frustration when the London media come up and talk about you know the difference between the constitutional positions 
and actually don't look at the domestic record and what's been achieved or not been achieved. You know, so Labour's job, and I blame the opposition, ourselves as included, we have not focused on those issues and concentrated on them until they become public scandals. And that's what we need to do. Um, and frankly, we can debate the constitution all you like, but if child poverty is rising and life expectancy is going the wrong way, I think those are the wrong priorities for us. And we should be talking about those things which are actually holding the country back. Thank you very much. Um, I know there's a sizable, uh, what there is, is there's a sizable part, 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 sorry, portion of the population who basically are in the maybe I, maybe no category for um, another referendum. So um, I'm now going to shift. We've not got Russell back, unfortunately. Um, maybe he's we off. Do, do you, Kat, we've got him back. Where, we where is he? Russell, where are you? Another I'm back. I'm back. Sorry, computer crashed. It must be the quality of this debate, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough uh, bandwidth for the chat. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, it, basically, yes, I'm, is, I think you were in the middle of your answer about basically, is this, is, yeah. is, 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 is this debate crucial for us becoming what we need to want to be or is it holding us back? I'll keep it uh, as short as I can because I know uh, that costs a bit of time. But um, I think in short, it's a bit of both. So we absolutely could be using the powers that the Scottish Parliament has to a much more full extent. So whether on fair work, inclusive growth, good jobs, COVID recovery, we can push much farther with the powers that we currently have than we are. And so you could argue that it's not the powers that are limiting us, it's ambition or delivery or political will. Um, however, I think, as I said in the last question, we should be quite relaxed, um, and certainly those on the pro-UK should be quite relaxed about a more powers debate rather down the line. Like Jackie, I think there are bigger priorities just now, um, but if we can see opportunities where more powers might help us with those, that shouldn't be seen as a victory for one side or the other of the constitution debate. It absolutely should be seen in the way that um, it used to be before 2014, which was a way to try and get the right powers with the Scottish Parliament rather than a more or a less. So I think a bit of both. Um, you know, we should be a bit more relaxed, I think, about more powers um, for the Scottish Parliament soonish. Uh, but that's not to say that we're using the current powers to their full extent. Great. OK, so I'm going to move into, I'm going to try, I, I, I'm not going to ask the qu kind of questions right as they are, but I'm going to try and take some themes, some common themes um, out of the, the, the questions. Thank you very much, everyone who has contributed. There's, some, there's actually some really interesting discussion actually going on in, in the chat box, if everyone wants to have a, have a look um, afterwards. But a couple of themes, and given that this is a UK-wide conference, and I think that um, for me, certainly, that one of the things that kind of gets le left out of this is that Scotland leaving the UK doesn't just affect Scotland, it affects the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, so what what role, you know, what, what where are we at in relation to the idea of a kind of another constitutional uh, change that affects all of the UK, federalism? Um, what is the role of um, Scots who are living in the rest of the UK in relation to another referendum? What role do they play in this discussion? Um, so I think that probably, and that's really all going to have time for. So yeah, where, where is, you know, in relation to this idea of the country that Scotland wants to be and how it gets there and whether that be constitutional or not, what, what does the rest of the United Kingdom, where does that interplay go? And I'll, 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 I'll actually, Russell, I'll, while we've got you and we've got your link working, we're going to stay with you just in case you, you disappeared again. <laughs> Not at all, thank you. Um, I think I'd be less hopeful that fixing the constitution across the UK is a fix in inverted commas for the Scotland debate. Um, I think it absolutely must happen, but much more so from the perspective of people living in England um, than those in Scotland. However, there is those interactions across the four nations of the UK that need to improve, absolutely, than from where they are now. Um, so to me, I think English devolution has to be something that people in England want and embrace and push for. And I can see huge benefits to that. Just look at the mayors um, in, in England and how their roles developed in quite a short period of time. But I'd, less, I'd, I'd be less hopeful that fixing somehow the rest of the UK could uh, you know, retain Scotland within the UK in and of itself. I think that's a separate debate that probably Scotland needs to get to the end of. Um, the last thing I'd say is that, you know, there are some lessons from Scotland for the rest of the UK, loads of them. And like Jackie said in the last question, 
it's a shame sometimes that uh, the media coming up to Scotland don't spend time on them. Um, but in particular, if we look at realignment following a referendum, we are still realigning from the 2014 referendum. I think that has some huge implications for Labour in England, if we look at a similar timescale for realignment following the Brexit referendum. Um, so I'd, I'd love more lessons. I'd love more you know, focus beyond the constitution of Scotland. However, I wouldn't be too hopeful that fixing the constitution outside of Scotland would, um, in essence, you know, make the debate go away up here. Thank you. And, and Fiona, you said that before you moved to Scotland, you, you'd you lived in, in um, another part of the UK, I don't want to assume which, um, for about, I think, six years, I think you'd said before you'd moved to Scotland. Um, please correct me if I was if I picked that up wrong. Um, you know, what does your, your experience of having lived outside of Scotland within the UK um, and the community, the communities that you were with there, how does that, um, how do you, what's their interplay with, with the discussions that are having in Scotland and, and do they, do, do you speak to people about it or, or is, is it kind of just, that's, that's, that's for us up here and they're not engaging. And I think, uh, I've I think a minute for you, for you before I move on to Jackie and then we have to wrap up. Right, I think we have, I, I think uh, Scotland is a different place. I lived in London for nearly 10 years. I think Scotland is a, is, is a different place. And I think what's important is really that, even as we're speaking about the constitution and we're speaking about all this, it really is important that we are considering how, um, how engaged uh, we are with, with diversity uh, and all forms of diversity, including ethnicity. I think in, in London, there's so much more diversity and maybe they've made a little bit more progress in terms of how people engage with that. And perhaps we need to embrace a bit more in Scotland that we're now a very diverse, uh, we're, we're much more diverse than we were 10 years ago, certainly more than we were 30 years ago. And so let's embrace that. It's, we are all different. That's one thing we have in common. Let's embrace it. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the things, actually, I'm, I, you know, the, the Scottish census has been postponed until next year. Um, and I think it'd be very interesting to see actually what's happened in the last 10 years um, demographically and a lot of different things across Scotland. I think that will a really important part will, will feed into this discussion. So, uh, so Jackie, you, you, the, the rest of the United Kingdom, where's, what's their role? What's their role in Scotland's future? OK, can I start just with a comment on what Fiona said? Because we used to have a slogan in government, one Scotland, many cultures. Um, and I don't think we celebrate our diversity well enough. But equally, I have to say, I think the rest of the UK happens to be more diverse than Scotland is currently. So we could learn from, from our colleagues elsewhere. Um, I was just reflecting that the franchise last time round was actually for Scots, for, for anybody living in Scotland at the time of the referendum. It ignored the Scottish diaspora in the rest of the UK, some 800,000 people, and it ignored the global Scots diaspora whose reach is even wider than that. Um, but I do think we need a new constitutional settlement for the whole of the UK. The, the, the memory that strikes me most as to why I believe that is watching Andy Burnham receive a phone call from officials in whether it was the Home Office or wherever to tell him that he wasn't getting any extra money um, and that I thought was an appalling way to treat the Mayor of Manchester. So, so there is maybe now a reason to look at the whole of the UK and some people call it federalism, to be honest, that doesn't mean anything to anybody, it leaves most of us cold, but I do think a new constitutional settlement um, that respects all different parts of the country is, is what is required. To be honest, in Scotland, um, identity frames that debate. If you're proud to be Scottish, then the assumption is you'll vote SNP and you'll be in favour of independence. Well, I'm proud to be Scottish, but I'm equally proud to be British. I'm proud to be a global citizen and I don't want you know, my future defined by narrow nationalism. But we need to get this right. We need to embrace the fact that not only are we proud to be Scottish, but we want the best for Scotland because it's the country we live in, as I want the best for the United Kingdom as well. And we do that by understanding people's concerns. The reason a lot of people are driven to vote for independence is they think that that is the route to a better, fairer nation. 
we need to demonstrate to them in everything that we do, both in terms of our opposition to the SNP and in terms of the offer for the future that we are making to them, that actually there is a different way of achieving that kind of progressive nation that we all want to live in that doesn't require us to tear ourselves out of the United Kingdom. Well, thank you very much. And thank you. Very, and look at that. 250 bang on um I'll, I'll just mention that in relation to stella creasy and peter kyle's session which went very over so i have been very pleased that our panel has had such an incredible um discussion thank you very much for your comments in the chat and that we've managed to actually stick to time uh, jackie fiona russell thank you very much thank you very much to progressive britain for inviting me um, to take part in this discussion uh, now just as a reminder um, i think the next uh, well, you need to go back into your email to click onto the link for the final sessions um, starting with uh, peter mandelson um and um so thank you very much to everyone and um yes enjoy the rest of your day